Public transport was an important part of urbanism of the Eastern Bloc's cities, so let's talk about that. I will mostly focus on trams, buses and trolleybuses, what roles they played, what were their strengths, weaknesses and of course what was the reality of their use in public transport systems. I will also lightly touch metros. In Altengrad, our Central European Eastern Bloc city, we will build two projects today. The first will be a big return to a district where I showed you the practical process of constructing a prefabricated panel house. So there we will remove the construction site, replace it with finished buildings and extend a tram line to a fancy new loop. The second project will be on the other side of the city, in the largest new district, where on the side of it we will extend another tram line to a new loop, but most importantly build a modern tram depot and a huge bus depot. Let's go. We inevitably have to look at some earlier history, since it was a very important factor for city planners to decide how to plan transportation networks later. Public transport, of course, was not invented after the Second World War, so the already established systems must have been considered. This is especially relevant for trams, as they were the oldest type of mass urban transportation and as such saw extensive use. The first electric tram appeared in 1875 in Russia and still in the 19th century spread to other countries. However, just like today, there were significant differences in the quality and density of tram systems in various cities, so once again, generalizing the whole Eastern Bloc is impossible. Although there are some general conditions that allowed the construction of extensive tram networks, trams only made sense in denser urban centers, not in small towns or countryside. They also made much more sense on some heavily used directions, such as into industrial zones. And of course, the city needed to have money to construct all these systems. All Central European capitals already had very extensive tram networks by the 1920s or 30s, with many other cities as well. But there were also cities that never had trams. This might have been because the cities were not so significant back then, were smaller, less dense, or simply could not afford them. This was apparently the case of a lot of cities further to the east in the Soviet Union, which in the 20s or 30s did not yet have high levels of urbanization as Central Europe of that time, or the Soviet Union some 50 years later. So trams only appeared there in the big old cities and newly industrialized cities, but overall not that many. In the 1920s, but more in the 30s, debates started on how to plan public transportation now when other already reliable option was available, a bus. Plus, personal cars started to appear, more towards the west rather than east, but appear nonetheless. The bus had many advantages over trams, but perhaps the most important was that it ran on the same surface as cars and trucks. No separate infrastructure was needed. The trend was to build bigger roads anyway, so it was then just a matter of sending a bus on it too. And traditional tram did not really fit into that equation anymore. Planners also argued that trams were less effective in inner cities due to their slow movement in tight curves and intersections, where they also slowed down other vehicles. Trolleybuses are apparently older than regular buses, but they did not see the same widespread use just yet before the Second World War. For example, in Berlin, there was a trolleybus system operating in 1882 for just two months, then another one in 1904 also for just two months, next one from 1912 to 1914. So those were clearly just experimental or pilot projects that did not do very well. The first proper system opened much later in 1933, although it wasn't very long. Poland, Czechoslovakia and Hungary, very similar situation with even fewer trolleybuses. So some experimental systems in the very early 20th century and then much later first proper systems. 1930 Poznań, 1933 Budapest, 1936 Prague no other pre-war systems in those countries. In the Soviet Union, pre-war trolleybuses were not particularly widespread either. Systems opened also in the 1930s in Moscow, Kiev, Chernyakhovsk, St. Petersburg and Rostov-on-Don. So from these dates, it is more than obvious that the early experiments could not beat trams. 
Just looking at pictures of old trolleybuses, it is clear that trams were bigger for more people, could certainly run faster and were likely more reliable, since trams were already not new. But as technologies progressed further, and especially as it was clear that road vehicles bring certain advantages over trams, as I mentioned earlier, trolleybuses made a little comeback in the 30s. So that was the pre-war introduction, just so we have the background for post-war situation. To summarize, lots of trams in urbanized and industrialized centers, so a lot more in Central Europe compared to the Soviet Union. Quite a lot of bus lines, sometimes already taking over from trams, and some limited trolleybus networks in just a few cities. And now there was the Second World War. Just like with any other structures, roads, tracks and electric wires were heavily damaged in cities. It would be logical to assume that buses could play a key role, since they only required repaired roads, but that was actually not the case. Tram tracks and electric wires were also restored very quickly, especially in German cities. Berlin restored over 300 kilometers of tracks already by the end of 1945. Although there were some cities where tram infrastructure was not rebuilt at all, mostly in the Soviet Union. The idea that tram is maybe not the futuristic type of transport for modern or modernist cities started to become louder after the war. Trams were considered old and unwieldy, while road vehicles were the modern alternative. However, buses were by far not perfect. First and foremost, they did not offer high capacity. That is a big problem if you want to connect big city districts. Then there are plenty of other disadvantages. They can get stuck in a traffic jam, stuck in a car crash, or they are loud and dirty. So it was clear that trams must keep their place in the overall public transport plan, but their roles would change to better fit their strengths, mainly much higher capacity. The specifics of distributing work between trams, buses and trolleybuses started to significantly differ between countries, but actually even between cities, because they all had different starting conditions and future outlook. Important things to consider were, for example, existence of pre-war systems, war damage, size of city, size of industry, planned expansion of city and industry, terrain situation, density of population, money, or availability of vehicles, as I will mention later. As much as central planners, especially the Soviet ones, wanted to achieve some uniformity in city development, it just wasn't possible because of all of these conditions. Before we continue, perhaps I should also touch questions like why was public transport even needed and where was the personal car in this equation? I explained cars in more detail in episode 66. There simply were not many cars around, so planners of city expansions could not count on them to move people around. Okay, but if that's true, then why did Eastern Bloc cities got all those big roads and urban highways? Because on one hand, central planning dictated the expansion of cities, and communist regimes were known for the push for rationalization, which raises the question why central planners simply didn't decide to provide paths for walking, public transport and cargo only. I'm just going to mention some points as food for thought, because it seems that this question would require much more extensive research. We can look at the situation politically. As I explored in episode 66, the populations simply wanted cars as a mean of increasing standards of living. And the communist regimes learned in the late 40s through 50s that there is a real danger of political instability from various economic problems and too strict repressions. Next point of view is economic. Car manufacturing was clearly going to become big, not manufacturing cars would rob countries of serious export opportunities. But if cars were already made and locals would not be able to buy them, then that would of course raise a few eyebrows and later pitchforks. Next, there was urbanism and then popular modernist theories from the late 50s when socialist realism ended. Modernism in the West clearly worked with the idea of very heavy road traffic where People would have lots of cars and drive them through cities on disconnected corridors wherever they wanted, as per the principles of functional separation. Modernist urbanism was accepted in the Eastern Bloc too, perhaps even strongly compared to the West. It certainly stayed longer compared to the West. 
What is interesting is that apparently the Soviet Union's planners were much more eager to apply modernist theories in Soviet cities compared to communist Central Europe. What's also interesting is that Soviet planners carefully studied works of American transportation planners of the 1930s, and both reached conclusions that trams should leave inner cities and vertical separation of traffic is needed. But anyway, back to the topic of big roads. When it was decided that communist countries would also equip its population with cars, plus promote consumerism, plus massively expand industry, it started the whole process of building bigger road grids. It's only logical. Suddenly, there had to be many more trucks delivering cargo around cities, people driving and parking their personal cars around, buses and trolleybuses had to deliver people on the same roads, and trams had to fit somewhere in there too, without slowing everything down. So bigger and bigger roads were the only solution, alongside a robust public transport system. Even though some reporters jokingly mentioned that everyone will eventually have a car at some point in the future, that would just not be the case, especially further east. Initially, public transport was simply the only way to get people to work, to move them from and into the big new residential developments. As car numbers rose, it started to become obvious that cities are just not large enough, could not be large enough to get rid of public transport entirely and rely on cars only. You know, something along the lines of cars create distances that then only cars can bridge. Car just has vastly inferior space efficiency. That article from 1957 I mentioned in some previous video perfectly illustrated this dilemma. On one hand, it warned against this inefficiency, but on the other hand, it went no further as it would, quote, contradict the officially accepted need for increasing standards of living, end quote. Nevertheless, the communist countries did not produce enough cars to completely clog the massive new road networks, although they did produce enough so that more lanes were seen as necessary. But we will never know how the communist regimes would eventually deal with that issue. Would they stop the promotion of cars at some point? Would they ban them completely? Would they return to the 40s way of thinking that car is too individualistic and not fit for a socialist society? Who knows? The reality simply was that public transport had to be in place, otherwise the economy could not function. Alright, so that was this little philosophical detour. Now let's return to the development of post-war public transport systems. The low capacity disadvantage of buses was very clear. Using them to move people between large city districts would not be ideal. On the other hand, expanding and maintaining tram infrastructure was expensive. So planners of cities started to rationalize their transportation systems based on economic and technical criteria. Smaller towns and cities, if they already had pre-war tram networks, generally started to remove them, as they were not large enough and did not need to move large enough numbers to justify spending money on trams. If those cities expanded, it would mean new expensive tram tracks to probably not large districts anyway, so buses could have managed just fine. But if the city was already buying new buses, might as well make them run through the whole city and replace trams entirely. That was the rationalization behind that change. Medium-sized cities already required those transportation capacities only allowed by trams, but the networks still could have been rationalized, especially if that city already saw a massive tram boom in the early 1900s, because back then tram was used everywhere, even in places where it was weak, so in inner city streets where it had to go through tight curves and intersections. The rationalization here was to only use trams in the main corridors, connect big transportation hubs and reach the outskirts and some bigger suburbs. That would also decrease travel time, as trams would quickly get through the inner city. In the outskirts, or just generally in places where space was available, trams would ideally be separated from roads, to first and foremost not block them, and also to increase tram speed. So several tram tracks would be removed and replaced by buses wherever high capacities were not needed. Larger cities had similar development, although with more emphasis on trams, since they simply could not manage the higher volumes of people without them. Big cities also seriously considered the use of subsurface systems to apply the principle of vertical separation. 
Streets were simply too crowded already, even the new big modernist avenues. Overall, stricter separation of trams from roads was needed in these bigger cities because trams had to move fast to provide quality connections even for distant outskirts. So, in some places, trams took the roles of some rapid light rail. That was tram theory, but like I said in the beginning, not all cities applied them like this, and it wasn't that simple because of other circumstances. So, let's take a look at some cities directly to see various differences, but also almost textbook examples. A good example of how trams were treated differently between the two Cold War blocks is Berlin. Berlin is a little special since it already had extensive pre-war metro system, however, the system was not divided equally between west and east. The western part had considerably larger network, but both sides had developed surface tram systems. By the late 1960s, West Berlin completely removed all of its tram lines. The reasoning was almost textbook modernism. Trams had to make way for cars on bigger roads, meaning that buses would take care of surface transportation instead, and high-capacity service would be the vertically separated metro. Metro played a key role in West Berlin's transportation, so it was even significantly extended in the 70s and 80s. East Berlin was also rebuilt according to the modernist principles. We have already talked about Alexanderplatz and some other residential districts where trams had to make way for the monumental boulevards and huge plazas which was also apparently influenced by some Soviet examples that the German architects studied. Soviets also preferred the removal of trams from inner cities, even during socialist realism earlier. And once again, Alexanderplatz would be served by vertically separated railways, both above surface and subsurface. However, the rest of East Berlin was largely not connected by existing metro. So, unlike in the West, Eastern planners decided to make good use of the existing tram networks, and even significantly expand them towards the new developments in the outskirts later. Some tracks were removed, mostly the ones near the Berlin Wall, since they became a dead end, but others as well, as part of the rationalizations of transport systems. So, using trams for their high capacity, and buses and trolleybuses where such capacity was not needed. Interesting is then a look at Berlin's tram network today, which is still largely concentrated to the former east, but even then it is the fourth largest tram system in the world. Metro in East Berlin was expanded only a little and considerably slower than in the west. East German cities in general had very strong relationship with their existing trams, even compared to the other socialist countries. German planners decided that cities down to 80,000 people will still have trams as the main backbone service, for volumes of people even below 5,000 an hour. In comparison, the Soviet cities considered 5,000 people an hour only for buses or trolleybuses, and removed trams from smaller cities with up to 150,000 people. Magdeburg is an example of a medium-sized city with strong pre-war tram network that went through an almost theoretical rationalization. A few tracks were removed in the city center to make way for car traffic, but the rest was kept and turned into a high-capacity system to connect the city center with its outskirts. The rest of the city would then be covered by buses and trolleybuses. Interestingly, the new pedestrian modernist Karl Marx Street was decided to have trams on it, which was actually the only remaining north-south tram corridor. The others were removed in favor of car traffic. That is a major difference compared to, for example, Berlin's Alexanderplatz, which removed trams in favor of pedestrians and cars, and Dresden's Prager Street, which removed trams and cars in favor of only pedestrians. So it only shows how urbanists or architectural principles are not carved in stone. Polish, Czechoslovak and Hungarian cities went through stronger rationalizations of their tram systems, especially Hungarian cities closed a lot of tracks, similarly to rationalizing their railways in the same time. Warsaw did not have any subsurface system, so it heavily relied on its trams in the immediate post-war time period. New tracks were relatively quickly restored and rebuilt into the standard gauge, and plans emerged for some vertical separation, as the newly constructed boulevards of New Warsaw were not keeping up. Those plans were abandoned in the late 40s in favor of classic metro. However, it wasn't until 1962 
when a metro project was finally made, but the actual construction started in 1983 and first line opened way longer in 1995. Unfortunately, the rationalization of transportation networks continued regardless of this slow metro construction. It was decided to remove the tram network entirely in favor of car and bus traffic. Several lines were removed, but it was clear that it's just not realistic to hope for a quick metro construction that could take over, so plans for tram removal were eventually slowed down and stopped. Nevertheless, some new very large districts were only served by buses, and the situation was far from ideal for a very long time. Tram situation in Prague was yet again different from Berlin or Warsaw. Prague was not heavily damaged during the war, so its tram network could continue doing its thing. And since there was no need for any serious post-war rebuilding, the tram tracks remained where they were. In the 1950s and 60s, when some of the new residential areas started to be built, trams were simultaneously built towards them, forming a backbone of those districts with buses filling in the gaps. However, due to the lack of any larger inner city boulevards or big natural corridors, all tram traffic that collected people in the outskirts eventually reached inner city, where the trams had to very painfully cross all the tight curves and super busy intersections due to the increasing car traffic, pedestrian traffic, and the tracks themselves were also struggling with all these new trams. There are some interesting shots from the 1950s and 60s showing long tram jams, ridiculously overcrowded stops and just cars passing by very close, almost like in city skylines. The traveling speed was very poor and overall quality of the system as well. Something like rationalizing the system in favor of buses was completely out of the question since even the high capacity trams were not keeping up although a couple of less used tracks were removed still. Only an underground system could have saved the city at this point. It was first decided to go for an underground tram, similarly to Warsaw at first, but Czech experts were split on the issue and finally Soviet experts recommended a standard metro, which started to be built in the 70s and first line opened relatively quickly in 1974, with other stations and lines following very soon. This drastically lowered tram usage, so rationalization could happen, similarly to other cities. Although trams still played a key role in surface transport and only a couple of tracks that copied the metro lines were removed. Budapest was initially similar to East Berlin as it heavily relied on its strong tram network with only one pre-war metro line. Uh, by the way, the oldest in continental Europe from 1896. It looks really nice, I've been there recently. But Budapest then, in the 60s and 70s, went through similar development as Prague, where trams were not keeping up, so new metro lines were relatively quickly built in the 70s. That allowed the rationalization of surface systems, but unlike Prague, Budapest removed a lot more tracks, which got replaced by buses and trolleybuses. I could briefly mention every single city of the region here, but you probably get the idea. And I already talked about some other cities in other videos. So just to sum it up, some of the general principles of rationalizations apply everywhere, but it all depended on the city, political decisions, economic circumstances, and so on and so on, like I said earlier. But now, let's return to the topic of trolleybuses. Trolleybuses were used similarly to internal combustion buses, so to replace trams. The initial cost for a trolleybus system is lower compared to tram, and you can run it on old and new roads, so it fits the modernist ideas of city traffic. But it still requires traction wires, so there are higher initial investments compared to regular buses. So the logical question is then, why not just use buses everywhere instead? This is actually a surprisingly complicated question, because a lot of sources simply do not mention these reasons at all. Some sources, like for example for the Polish city of Lublin, simply state that it is not known why city planners chose to establish a trolleybus network alongside existing bus systems in the early 1950s. So, Let's try to dive deeper into this issue. If you open a Wikipedia page for a trolleybus, it lists some advantages and disadvantages compared to trams and combustion engine buses. However, what is really important to understand is that those are today comparisons and they significantly changed over time. They were certainly not the same some hundred years ago. 
Like I mentioned in the beginning, there were some experimental trolleybus systems around, mostly in Germany and Czechoslovakia in the early 1900s. And then nothing for at least two, three decades. So in those times, trolleybuses were just bad. They were not able to beat trams. With the rapid development of internal combustion engines, buses quickly became viable. That is roughly the 20s and 30s. Then after the Second World War, in the late 40s and early 50s, the situation apparently changed. But this is where I'm going to speculate a little, because I did not find a decisive answer to these questions. Facts first though. Trolleybus systems started to be established or significantly expanded in many cities in that time period. Lines opened in 1951 in East Berlin, 47 Dresden, 51 Magdeburg, 41 Pilsen, 49 Brno, 46 Warsaw, 41 Bratislava and so on and so on. Many systems opened. Prague or Budapest already had trolleybuses from the 1930s, but those were rather the exception. And now for the speculation. My main theory is that in this time period the trolleybus simply offered much better technical specifications compared to the bus. Electric engine technology was already on a good level and could provide much more power for even lower weight and volume of the engine. No need for a gearbox, clutch, various oil systems and so on. So even higher durability. It is frequently mentioned that trolleybuses were mostly considered for lines with steep slopes because of the power advantage. When it comes to fuel or operating costs, this is where, again, I'm not sure. Perhaps it might be logical to theorize that immediately following the Second World War, diesel fuel was not that available, since the possibility of a third world conflict was very real. This is supported by, for example, the Czechoslovak truck production, I already talked about it, how central planners did not want to produce personal cars in the late 40s and early 50s as they feared a possible conflict, so wanted to manufacture cargo trucks instead for military purposes. But it might have also been some inertia in thinking from the war, during which fuel was scarce, traveling by car was even banned, so people simply got used to the idea that fuel is not granted, but electricity from coal or hydropower is maybe more reliable. Also, we see that some systems were established even during the war, so fuel certainly played the main role there. What most likely did not play a role was the capacity advantage, because there was none. It was basically the same as regular bus and much lower compared to the tram. The other advantages, like lower noise and zero emissions, I'm not so sure those were that critical at that time point, but maybe I could be wrong. In any case, just like with the approach to trams, trolleybuses were not used everywhere equally. Their highest popularity was throughout the 1950s, but started to stagnate in the 60s and even close down in the 70s. But why? Well, here the picture is a little clearer. Trolleybuses simply did not offer anything vastly superior compared to trams and buses anymore. Especially the fuel situation changed, as new oil pipelines were constructed from the Soviet oil fields into Central Europe, and this oil was sold very, very cheaply. Plus, political decisions were made, under the Soviet influence of course, depending on the country, to very heavily use this oil wherever possible. New types of better vehicles were developed, both buses with better engines and trams for higher capacity. So a trolleybus was a little redundant in the whole mix, especially with its higher initial costs for the infrastructure compared to buses. East Germany closed practically all of its trolleybus systems by mid-1970s, some even before. Although Germans always had lukewarm approach to trolleybuses, because they did not remove trams as much as other countries. Poland was similar with closing down its systems by early 1970s, with only Gdynia and Lublin keeping their early networks. But Poland also removed a lot of their trams and relied a lot on Soviet oil fueling their buses. Czechoslovakia was different. Only Prague, České Budějovice and Děčín closed their systems in the 70s, while other systems remained in most major cities. Although with some lines removed and overall the networks stagnated in favor of buses. Hungary only had trolleybuses in Budapest at this time and also wanted to gradually get rid of them, but that eventually did not happen. The situations changed with the 1970s oil crises, 
they did not hit the socialist countries as badly as the West because Soviet oil kept flowing and Central Europe was buying it for five-year average prices, which means it was calculated as an average from previous five years. So any sudden spike would not be immediately present. But the next five-year average would already count with those oil shocks and it eventually also worked the other way around. When worldwide prices dropped after the shocks, the average did not reflect that and socialist countries were suddenly buying very expensive Soviet oil, which happened in the 1980s. But nevertheless, planners in the 70s were not blind to the world development and political decisions were made to once again shift more away from oil. Central planning worked with heavy inertia though, so those plans for removal of trams and trolleybuses were still in place for some time. East Germany did not reopen any trolleybus lines and continued with their electric trams just like before. Poland toned down its removal of trams and even restored trolleybuses in Warsaw in 1983 and opened new system in Tichy in 82. Czechoslovak existing systems stopped stagnating and even expanded some more, but new systems in other cities were not opened. Hungary opened new networks in Seged in 1979 and Debrecen in 85. Other cities had plans for building new networks, but that was already the late 70s and 80s, which was a time period of broad economic struggles of the socialist countries towards the end of the communist rule, so money was just not there anymore for new investments. Let's also make a little detour into the Soviet Union, because trolleybuses played a vastly different role there. Perhaps that is the reason why a lot of you guys always suggest trolleybuses for Altingrad, so let's explain the difference. Soviet Union did not have that extensive pre-war tram network, so it could not continue this tradition after the war. When they debated whether to use trams, trolleybuses or buses, they would have to build infrastructure for all three. Unlike majority of Central European cities, where tram tracks were already there. Soviet planners also overall worked with more radical modernist visions of their cities and trams just did not fit that. It was decided that buses will be used similarly to Central Europe, but trolleybuses will fill the higher capacity level, unlike Central Europe, where that was already a job for trams. This was a problem at first, since trolleybus only has the same capacity as a regular bus. So Soviet engineers started to develop the trolleybus trains in the 1960s, coupling together two vehicles. This suddenly put trolleybus in the higher capacity category so it could function similarly to tram, but it still offered those road vehicle advantages that Soviets wanted. Although I should note here that it still had slightly lower capacity compared to big new trams. This was not done in Central Europe at all. Articulated buses and trolleybuses were only in prototypes and small production versions still and it wasn't until later 70s when serious productions began to be delivered into cities. This leads me to the topic of vehicle selection and availability, which played a huge role in planning public transport. Soviets were simply not able to manufacture or import enough trams to consider planning huge tram networks in hundreds of their cities. But vehicle availability was a problem for Central Europe too. Factories just could not keep up. Thousands, maybe tens of thousands of new buses and trolleybuses had to be made in newly established factories, sometimes without any prior tradition of bus and trolleybus manufacturing. Suddenly there was demand for new types of high capacity, high speed trams to replace the old rolling stock. Old Prague's Tatra factory producing the famous T3 trams was bursting at its seams with bodyworks and finished vehicles stored among traffic on nearby streets. Apparently there was a foreign visit to the factory at some point and when Czechs showed them around, showed them the facilities, the foreigners were shocked and said something like, okay that's a nice museum but can we now please see the factory where you make thousands of vehicles a year? Each communist country built their own trams, buses and trolleybuses, but their manufacturing capacities differed. Politics also played a big role, for example Germans were banned from building their own trams since late 1960s and their trolleybus production also ended by mid 50s. So Germans relied on Czechoslovak trams and trolleybuses, according to the international idea of national specializations of production. I was already talking about that in regards to the trains. 
So as you can see, situations were somewhat complicated from pretty much every angle you can look at it from. We would have to examine each city more thoroughly to see the conditions and solutions. But that is just beyond the scope of this relatively short video. Uh, short for this topic, that is. But I hope that I gave you some initial information and maybe you learned something new, as always. Now, one last thing. I already said it before, but it's kind of fitting in this video to repeat it. So, I'm not going to build metro and trolleybus systems in the city, in the game. Gameplay-wise, the city doesn't need metro. Project-wise, metro is just boring to build, yeah? Because you literally only see the entrance. Sure, I could build some surface segments, but that's literally just urban train at that point. And we are already building those. I could build some kind of construction site of a metro station, maybe in the center. That could look nice, but that's just way too much work to then cover it all up. So, no metro. Trams, trains and buses are way more satisfying to build and observe in the game. Trolleybuses. As I outlined earlier, it's not like every single city in Central Europe had a trolleybus network. Some countries more than others, yeah, sure, but a lot of big cities simply hadn't. I'm not building a Soviet city, remember. Besides, trolleybuses, from what I have seen, are way too frustrating to build right in city skylines. Dealing with tram wires is already tough, now I would have to deal with wires that precisely need to match the moving power collectors. Yeah, no thanks. So that is that. I'm 100% decided on this, all right? So with that out of the way, let's jump into the city. Well, this topic got longer than I thought and the time lapse shorter than I thought. So here we are in the cinematics. But as you could have seen, these projects were pretty straightforward. In the first one, I built the tram loop using tracks I whipped up using the road builder mod, but heavily modified with importing tracks from other networks. And around the loop, I just completed the rest of the residential district. I used more modern buildings to make a clear difference from the previous phase in the 60s. Uh, for this newer phase, I took heavy inspiration from Dubravka estate in Bratislava. I also built a little central heating plant in the corner and prepared for some bus lines. The second place was only a little extension of the residential area, following the established layout where I was mostly inspired by the Vavrishev estate in Warsaw. The tram depot is based on the one in Poruba, district of Ostrava, bus depot on the central repairing garages in Prague, and the new urban railway station on some U and S-Bahn stations in Berlin. As you could have seen, the urban railway is eventually going to connect to that other train terminus station on the other side of the city. And when that happens, it will be a huge connection for this entire half of the city, really. So I expect a lot of people to use this railway. Uh, it is the most used railway in the city right now already, but it's probably going to be used even more. Otherwise, I just used mostly the same techniques as in episodes before. So that was that. The next episode will be another big return to an older unfinished district. Uh, there is only one left, so it's not hard to guess which one. We will finish it with the appropriate versions of prefabricated panel houses, and it will be a very good opportunity to finally make an episode about the living conditions in those, both back in the day and today. We could also explore how were people able to get housing in the communist times and just overall how the living environment and conditions evolved. And that will wrap up the 1970s. Anyway, thanks for watching today. Hope you liked the video. You know the drill. So if you did, then please click thumbs up, write some funny comment, share it. Subscribe if you're new here or you could become a channel member, which is the direct way of supporting this channel and me in what I'm doing. Big thanks to all of you existing channel members. I really appreciate your support. Thank you so much. That is all. Take care and goodbye.